Picture this, it's getting to the end of the season, you grew a killer crop of tomatoes in your garden and you're wondering, how do I get the same results next season? So you have the bright idea of taking a tomato, saving the seed and planting it out next year. What could go wrong? The truth is a lot could go wrong because most of us have forgotten this time honored and in fact ancient technique for propagating plants across seasons and even generations. So we're gonna head on out to Florida and talk to Shani to get a complete crash course, not only in seed saving, but understanding how species and cultivars and even plant varieties work. And at the very end, you'll learn exactly how to save your favorite tomato for next season. Hey everyone, Shani here. I've been working professionally in the horticulture industry for the last 15 years. And for 10 of those years, I worked for an heirloom seed company. My job was to educate gardeners all about how to save their own seeds. So whether you are just trying to save a little money on your annual seed purchases, or start a local seed library within your community, or you endeavor to be a backyard breeder and learn how to select traits and breed your own special heirloom seeds to pass down to future generations. This video is for you. Now I am gonna share with you today a little plant biology lesson. And you certainly don't need to be a plant reproductive biology expert to be a great seed saver. However, having a little baseline of knowledge is going to help you to get on your seed saving journey. So let's talk about the plant life cycles. First, we have annuals, and these are going to sprout, grow, make seed, and die within the span of just one year. Some popular annuals would be lettuce or cucumbers. Then we've got biennials. Biennials are going to take two years to complete their life cycle. In their first year, they're going to sprout and grow. Then they're going to go dormant over the winter. They're going to return the next season for their flowering phase and then they will finally die out. Some popular garden biennials would be carrots and beets. Finally, we have perennials. And perennials are going to sprout and grow in that first season. Then they're going to go dormant and then going to come back the following season. And perennials can do this over an incredible length of time. There are short-lived perennials. Think things like asparagus, which could live a few years, up to 20 years. And then we have long-lived perennials, think ancient redwood trees that are living for hundreds, thousands of years. Next, we're gonna talk about plant pollination. This is how plants go from flower to producing seed. So first up, we've got the self-pollinating plants. These are the crops that have perfect or complete flowers, meaning each individual flower contains both the male and female parts required to reproduce. They don't require any outside influence in order to make seeds for saving in the future. Some examples of self-pollinating plants would be tomatoes and beans. And these crops are the easiest for beginner seed savers. And then there are plants that require cross-pollination. There are plants that have separate male and female flowers contained on one plant. Examples of this would be a squash plant, or a corn plant. These will need a little intervention across their pollen, but they are on one single plant and they're called monoecious plants. When we're saving seeds on the cross-pollinated crops, we're going to employ things like making an isolation distance to block pollen or even manually bagging blooms. This is more of an expert level, intensive method of seed saving. So today we're really gonna cover the self-pollinating crops because those are a little more beginner friendly. So let's break down the difference between heirloom open pollinated seeds and hybrid seeds. Heirloom open pollinated seeds breed true. This means that their genetics have been stabilized. What that practically means for you gardeners is that when you save the seeds on say a red ruffled heirloom tomato and you plant those seeds the next season, fruit that you'll get on that plant will be identical or very similar to the fruit that you save the seeds on so the fruit looks like its parent plants. Now with hybrid seeds, those are two genetically different parents who have been crossed using controlled pollination. This means that hybrid seeds are typically genetically unstable and you really can't breed them true or get the same result when you save the seeds of a hybrid plant. When we save the seeds of a hybrid tomato, what you get the next year is going to be a random cross of genetics and it's often so random that the fruit is fairly undesirable. Have you ever heard of plant taxonomy? This is the science of naming and grouping plants into distinct plant families and categories. Taxonomy is famously not the most exhilarating branch of plant science. 
However, I do encourage you to stick with me for this portion of the video because taxonomy is crucial in learning how to properly save seeds and knowing just a little bit about plant names is going to go a long way for you gardeners. Plants are categorized in kind of a pyramid shape. We start really broad with the plant kingdom. We work our way to something more narrow like the plant family. And finally, we narrow it down to the genus and species. This is also known as the Latin name. This is going to tell you specifically what crop you're working with. Some folks will refer to the genus and species as the generic and specific name, which is a pretty good way to look at it. Let's take a look at something like a seed packet. You'll often find the common name at the top and just below it in italics, you'll see two words, the genus and species, the Latin name, and it'll be in italics. The genus is always the first word in the name and it's always capitalized, while the species is always the second word and it's always got a lowercase. Members of the same genus can look very similar to one another or very different. They're really not categorized by how they look. They're more grouped together by having a wild ancestor in common or having very similar growing conditions. Practically for us seed savers, it's important to know that members of different genuses cannot cross with one another. Here's where it gets complicated. Different members within the same genus sometimes can cross and sometimes they won't cross at all. And it really is a crop by crop basis. Now species is the second word in that Latin name. This is the most specific that plant naming gets. You will see crops that have the same genus and species name as one another that look wildly different and still can cross. An example would be a big beefsteak tomato and a tiny cherry tomato. They look very different, but their pollen can absolutely cross and make a hybrid. Common plant names or plant nicknames can belong to a huge range of different plants, some related and some completely unrelated. For example, if I tell you that I'm growing beans this year, that can, that can range wildly depending on where I'm from and what I consider a bean. Maybe I'm talking about Phaseolus vulgaris, the common French green bean, but I also could be referring to Phaseolus coccineus, which would be the scarlet runner bean. They're in the same genus, but they have a different species. Or I could tell you that I'm growing the snake bean this year. And snake bean isn't even a legume. It's not in the bean family. It's a true gourd. It has absolutely no potential of crossing. It's a totally different crop. So learning the Latin name is going to tell you what you're actually growing what plant family it belongs to, and most practically, who it can potentially cross with for your seed saving purposes. So you got out to the garden, you saved those seeds. The next question is, how do you store them? We just have to meet three important criteria. You need cool, dark, dry conditions. I keep my seeds in a glass container, ensuring that they're airtight. And these are some jicama seeds that I saved recently. I make sure to put a silica packet in just to pull out any extra moisture that might be hiding in there. But this is going to make sure that they say super dry. This is the moment we've all been waiting for, our hands-on seed saving tutorial. There are two major methods for seed saving. We have dry seed saving and wet seed saving. Dry seed saving consists of simply allowing your seeds to mature and dry on the plant and hand harvesting them. This is a butterfly pea plant. I just allow the pods to mature and dry right on the plant and then I hand harvest them. It's as simple as that. They're ready to go into storage. In dry seed saving, hand picking is great if you're a home gardener or if you're not saving too many seeds. But if you're saving a large quantity or if you expect a lot of rain and humidity in the upcoming weeks and you don't think your plants are going to dry in time for the first frost, you can actually cut or pull those plants up hang them upside down and allow the pods to finish drying from there. The second method of seed saving is wet seed saving. This is essential for crops where the seeds are encapsulated in a wet fruit. Today we're gonna save seeds on this ruffly red tomato. And seed saving tomatoes is a breeze. What we're going to do is cut that fruit and we're going to just smush, trying to get mostly just seeds into the jar. And of course you're going to get some skin, you're gonna get some pulp in there but that's totally fine. And you'll notice that tomato seeds are surrounded by this sort of jelly-like substance. That is going to make the seeds come together and it's going to inhibit germination because 
the tomato doesn't want to start sprouting its seeds too early inside the fruit. It wants to pass those seeds on for next generation. So there is a slight germination inhibitor encapsulated in that gel coating around the tomato seed. And that is why we're going to do a fermentation for these seeds. We're gonna leave this jar on our countertop out of direct sunlight for three to five days. Fermentation has benefits. It's going to break down potential diseases that the seeds may be harboring. Tomatoes have developed a mechanism for preventing their seeds from prematurely sprouting. And this is a natural germination inhibitor found around each tomato seed. And your seeds are going to sprout more vigorously and more readily when you plant them next spring. Okay, this is day four of the tomato seeds fermenting and it is time to separate them and get them dried off. Very likely you'll see a layer of mold on the top of your tomato slurry. It's no big deal, we're gonna scoop it right off. You've probably also noticed that some of your tomato seeds are floating at the top and most of them are sunk at the bottom. The ones at the bottom are viable, which means they will germinate. The ones that have floated at the top actually are dead and not going to sprout. So we're gonna scoop off the mold and the floaty seeds. So I'm gonna take my tomato seed slurry. I'm going to pour it into a larger glass jar and fill it with water to help the separation. I'm gonna watch as all of my viable seeds are sinking to the bottom and any of the floaters are getting scooped off. Next, I'm going to pour all this junk off the top while I carefully make sure not to pour out the seeds at the bottom. Once again, I'm going to add more water and I'm going to allow the seeds to sink to the bottom, adding a bit more fresh water so that I can keep pouring off any of the dead seeds, the mold, and extra tomato skin lying around. Now, all I have left are the viable seeds. So I'm gonna pour them into a mesh strainer. And then I'm just gonna dry them in room temperature out of direct sunlight for a few days. This is the final dry down that your seeds are going to need before you put them into long-term storage. My long-term storage back in the day did not look anything like this crazy contraption here. It was just photo organizer boxes I bought off of Amazon for maybe 10 or $20 and stored in a cool, dry and dark place. These days, Seed saving and collecting is kind of a hobby of mine. So I have a lot of giant vegetables that were sent to me by a friend that you cannot buy. These are not purchasable. The only way to produce seed like this is to save it from a variety that was grown. And so seed saving is such a fun and important practice for us to get into as gardeners. I highly encourage you to try it out. If you're looking for inspiration on what to grow to then maybe save, check out our monthly planting guys right here. Good luck in the garden and keep on growing.